Hi, everybody online. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 1, verse 6, using our book by Ken Ham. You can get this on Amazon. Um, yeah, for those of you guys who, who don't have one yet, you can get them on Amazon. Really, it's the quickest way. Uh, Answers in Genesis uh, is kind of backed up on orders. Um, that's, well, we know why. Uh, <laughs> we don't even need to go there. But uh, Amazon should have some. They had plenty in last time we checked. But um, yeah, so Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. We're going to be moving on to day 2. Um, so we said that days are 24-hour days according to Genesis in the Hebrew. That's the word yom. Um, how, how do we measure today what a 24-hour day looks like? What determines what a 24-hour day is? Rotation. The rotation of the earth, right? We have daylight. Um, how do we determine what a month is? What's that based on? 30 rotations? No. It's based on a, cel on a celestial object. It's based on the moon, right? So it's based on the moon. Uh, how do we determine uh, a year? Around the sun. Around the sun, right? Um, and that's why, obviously, I, I don't know all the science of this. The earth has a tilt. <laughs> but when it gets to a certain point around the sun, the tilt <coughs> is not in our favor. And because we're not near the equator, it gets really cold as it's been. That's why it's been freezing uh, this winter. <laughs> so, um, you know, and you have other factors. But um, where do we get the week from? Where does a, where does a week come from? From God, from God, right? He's Exodus twenty eleven. He says, uh, you know, for in six days God created the heavens and the earth and rested the seventh day. He tells us, so you should rest as well and observe the Sabbath. And so, yeah, you don't find the work week anywhere in 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 nature or anything like that. But it is built into human society by God. We see that for all of human history, unconnected cultures have a week and. It is kind of odd when you look at it from like a naturalistic perspective, but when you look at it from a biblical perspective, that's where we left off talking about God creating this as a pattern for us. Can someone read Genesis 1, 6 through 8 really quick? Because this is where we're at now, moving on from day 1. 1, 6. Yeah, 1, 6 through 8. Yeah. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters from which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so that the evening and the morning were the second day. Okay, so looking at this, I want to share with you two possible theories. Um, I, I take one theory over the other as probably a little bit more likely, but... Either one is, is, is probable. Respectable scientists and, and creationists hold both positions, so I just want to give you both of them. I don't think it's really one to go to war over, to be honest. It's not like saying man evolved from apes. That's wrong. We say that. Everybody agrees on that in the creationist community. But this is one of those things that's like, it's kind of interesting. So you notice what it says in verse 6. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Why? Let it divide the waters from the waters. You got the waters above the firmament, and you have the waters below the firmament into verse 7. So the first theory is what's called the canopy theory. The canopy theory. And, and it was interesting, actually, uh, one of you guys pointed out uh, last week that, you know, there are some scientific problems with this, but, you know, if you look at it in today's terms, but, you know, things were different back then. So it's very probable that while this wouldn't work today, it might have worked back then. We do know that the Earth's magnetic field and stuff is, is decaying very rapidly. And, and there was a lot of factors that could have been different where this actually, from a scientific perspective, could have worked out. We also understand that we serve a God who created the universe from nothing. So if he wanted to create a water vapor canopy, he, he could absolutely do that. Um, and so basically what this proposal is, though, the Earth was water and... I don't know what would have caused it through evaporation through just supernatural means god caused a water vapor canopy to appear uh, outside the earth outside of what we would call the atmosphere and so uh, people proponents of this look at verse six and they say well clearly god divides the waters from the waters and, and so there, there had to have been some kind of vapor layer it's a very clear reading of the text they also point to the fact that people live to long ages. And how do you explain, even after the fall, that people live to 900 years old? Well, 
it could potentially be this water vapor because you do see after the flood the lifespan drops and it begins dropping pretty rapidly but before the flood people lived to a long time before the flood you have things on the earth like uh, dinosaurs things that are able to thrive um, and, and we, we'll get into dinosaurs and stuff at a little different time. <laughs> yes, we do believe that man and dinosaur did live together in young earth creation. And I, I do think there's some pretty substantial evidence for that, um, even in archaeology, by the way. But they would argue that people live so long because, you know, you have the sun. Oh, boy. I'm going to put some. This indicates that, that if the sun was actually that close to the earth. <laughs> also, <laughs> I'm just realizing something. It's definitely not drawn to scale either because... Uh, the sun, if it was actually that small, wouldn't work out so well for us either. But um, the sun basically releases uh, UV radiation, which radiation, as we know, can cause things like genetic mutations, which lead to cancer and other things like that, harmful genetic mutations. So according to this theory, people live so long because they weren't, uh, they weren't exposed to UV radiation as much. Um, now, there are some problems, too. It, it, it is potential that, that this would actually cause an overall average temperature of the earth that would not necessarily be sustainable for life. Um, that, I mean, nobody has actually been able to create a model of this that would effectively work as far as not killing everything on earth, because we're talking after the fall. This would have existed after the fall up to Genesis 6. And so um, could it account for people living longer? Potentially, yes, I think. Um, you know, they also argue that there would have been potentially more oxygen available as well while this water vapor barrier was there. Now, again, the physics of the atmosphere now tell us that this would not be possible. The atmosphere can't hold this much <clears throat> precipitation now. That doesn't mean it couldn't do it back then. Um, let me point out another interesting point. Now, I don't, this, is, this is something that Answers in Genesis and Institute for Creation <clears throat> Research have played with as an idea. I don't know the feasibility. I'm not an atmospheric scientist, so I'll just tell you. They have said it's possible that the water vapor barrier wasn't actually like a mist. It was like an ice, like a cloud of ice. Now, do we have any examples of that in space? Yes, we do. You have, you have planets like Saturn that have a ring, but then you have planets like Neptune that have a field of ice around them. And so Neptune having a field of ice shows that it's at least possible somewhere in the galaxy um, so in theory it could have been possible with the original earth if, if I'm saying this theory is correct I'm gonna say it was probably an ice barrier uh, of, of some sort I don't think a vapor barrier would necessarily work I think it would be like a field of ice like Neptune has. Yeah, in addition to that Dr. Henry Morris surmises <laughs> that the the oxygen saturation levels would be sufficient enough for allow for the duck, some of the larger dinosaurs of that time to yeah. to be able to um, absorb enough oxygen to live. Now, whether yeah. that's true or not, again, is open to interpretation. And there are some theories with that because dinosaurs obviously are reptiles, would require a certain type of environment to live. No, and you think of that like lizards even living in a terrarium, how they benefit with that. You also have the fact there are some scientists, I've read some credible things, that suggest that dinosaurs have small lung capacities for their body mass. And so it could possibly have been, now, after the flood, that might not have been what killed dinosaurs, but it might have affected their reproduction rates. We know that. It might have slowed down the amount that they were reproducing. And then we know, who's the mighty hunter of Genesis 11? Does anybody know his name starts with an N? Nimrod. Nimrod. We know that Nimrod and the early people were involved in what we would say as, like, overhunting or, or taking more than you need. Just to show off, Nimrod was a guy who liked to show off how well of a, how good he was at hunting. He didn't like to hunt for the food. He liked to hunt because he wanted essentially to be worshipped as this great mighty hunter. And so, is it possible that humans and environment could have affected the life of dinosaurs? Absolutely. Um, and so, now there's another theory to this as well. I, I think that seems like the more I'm talking about this theory, the more it sounds probable. But <laughs> you get into the other theory. I'm almost talking myself back into believing this one. This is what I always held to. Um, but, you know, there, there are some problems with this. Look at in the book, uh, and if, you're, if you don't have the book, you can actually reference Genesis 1.20. Ken Ham's going to be referencing Genesis 1.20 here. I'll read it out of the book because there's some other commentary that Ken actually says here. He starts to list some problems with this. 
He says, uh, Genesis 1.20, I think this is the New King James he's reading of. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. Now notice that word there. The birds are flying across the expanse of the heavens. Now go down to verse 15, uh, well actually it would be back, verses 15 through 17 of Genesis verse 15 through 17 of Genesis 1. It says, and there's going to be, I'm reading from the book, so he leaves a part out. And let them, that would be the stars, be lights in the expanse of the heavens. Notice that wording. To give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. Obviously the sun and the moon, we know that. And the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. Okay, so the thought that Ken Ham is going to say is he is going to try to make the argument that the expanse of the heavens has two levels to it. You have, uh, which actually, let's, let's, this is the first model, so we'll put number one here. According to Ken Ham's model, and I'll try to do this so I'm not like, I don't know if I'm blocking anybody. Um, you have the Earth, obviously. Um, well, this is probably not the best drawing. You have, you have this space right here. This would be like your atmosphere. So this would be the expanse of the heavens, part one. That's the atmosphere. And then beyond our atmosphere, you have... Well, how do I draw stars? Um, <laughs> that's so bad. Um, you guys can see why I became a teacher and didn't go to art school. Um, but, uh, yeah, you have the atmosphere and you have the stars. He makes the argument that the same terminology, at, uh, expanse of the heavens, is referring to both the place where the birds fly and both the place where the stars dwell. And so he's making the argument that the expanse of the heavens can't be talking about the space between the waters only, why? Because we see the stars sitting in the firmament of the heavens also. And so to say that they're referring to the same thing would be to say that God created the stars here really close to the earth and then slung them out. And I don't think the text really says that. And so that is one of the complications with this, the language here. It seems to be that Ken Ham may have the advantage with his view if you're taking like a very literal reading of the text. And again, I'm not ruling out this view. You, there are some potential counter arguments, but I'm just saying it, it, it does, I'm dropping stuff like crazy. It does make it very, um, very difficult. So if you look at the next page, I wanna read a few summaries here that, that he says and, and just kind of get your, get your thoughts on this. Um, Ken Ham says at the top of page 42, he says, So the flying creatures were to fly across the expanse, and the sun and moon and stars were in the expanse. So what does all this mean? He summarizes. Uh, point one, the expanse is outer space where the sun, moon, and stars are. The waters above the expanse are the outer boundary of the universe. The phrase across the face of the expanse of the heavens means in the atmosphere where the birds fly, the waters under the expanse are the waters covering the surface of the earth. And so he is trying to make the case, and I, I will say, to his credit, modern astrophysics actually does back this up to a degree. They're, and they're not Christians, by the way, but there are some, I mean, they're not, they don't have an agenda in this. But there are some scientists today who point to the fact the very outward edge of the universe. There are some scientists who say the universe is eternal, distance-wise. That's not correct, I don't believe, from, from just what we understand about physics, what I've read, and, and what I think the Bible teaches. But there are scientists who believe that the outward edge of the universe does have a collection of water, whether it be in the form of ice, whether it be in the form of some type of mass reserves of water. Um, that, that could potentially be true. Now, you know, if you look at this, we'll get into the flood and how all that relates, but so according to Ken Ham, you have the waters below would be the earth, then you have the waters above, that would be the waters at the outward edge of space. I think that that's probably the most probable thing, first of all, because I think it's literally the best reading of the text. But then the other thing is modern science is also beginning to corroborate that theory as potentially true. Now that doesn't mean that the canopy theory is wrong. In fact, 
you could, you could almost have a combination of both. I mean, the text could be referring to this. There still could have been some kind of layer of an ice ring around the Earth, too. And that, that, there's no ruling that out, even if, the, even if Ken Ham's correct. Why? Because if you read in Genesis 6, one of the sources of the flood is the fountains of the deep. Does anybody know the language of one of the other sources of the flood? What does it say? Heavens open up. Right. How does it describe the heavens? It describes it as opening what? Something like you open in your house. Floodgates? Like a faucet. The floodgates, kind of. The something of heaven. What's that? No, no. Um, you said window? No, That's no, correct. <laughs> yes, the windows of heaven. <laughs> I do that. I do that all the time in my class. If nobody's getting the answer, I'd be like, I'd be like, oh my gosh, you said Toussaint Charbonneau? Well, that's correct. Yes, excellent, excellent. Um, yes, the w windows of heaven would be, would be the correct, uh, yeah. So, yeah, that does give you the picture that there was something up there that was substantial, that was opened up. You could look maybe at just this figurative language, but um, so, yeah, I mean, in theory, you could reconcile both views as, as potentially being true. But... Um, all right, does anybody have any questions or, or comments on that? Because I want to read one final thing from, from Ken Ham. If you, look, um, if you look down to the bottom paragraph on page 42, it says, Now on day four, God says three times in verse 14, 15, and 17 that he put the sun, moon, and stars in the firmament that he made on day two. Then the Bible tells us that day five, God created the birds to fly across the face of the expanse. That would be the firmament. So after much more study of other verses that talk about the expanse and the firmament, we can say that the expanse of firmament is the sky, which includes both the blue sky we see where the birds are flying and the clouds floating in, and the night sky where the sun, moon, and stars are. And so that's kind of how he summarizes this. To make it work, again, it would be kind of complicated because you'd have the sun, moon, and stars created within the atmosphere and somehow transported out. It doesn't seem likely, but again, I might not be reading, reading the text uh, necessarily correct. Um, all right, so let's, um, let's move on. I, I think that we've kind of mentioned a lot of things. We're going to move on to page uh, 44, page 44. Um, now, some of this stuff we've already talked about quite a bit. Like on page 44, we've already talked about how Genesis, a literal reading of it, the order is different than what evolution says and how evolution and all that stuff doesn't really fit into the Bible. We, we've been through weeks of that, and especially for those of you watching online, if you watch weeks like two, three, and four, we really get into those contradictions and stuff. So I, I want to talk about gravity for a second, and I also want to talk about the fine-tuning of our, our planet for life. Yes. Are you, okay, so for a distinct, for distinctive purposes, you're... So are we establishing, because we talk about the three heavens. So when you're talking about what you're talking about today, you're talking about the second heaven? Yes. Okay. So the first heaven would be where the birds fly. Right. The second heaven would be where the stars are. Right. Um, and there are some who would disagree with this, obviously. The third heaven would be a place outside of the universe, would where, be where, where God where dwells. Where God is. And that's, that's I, don't believe, I don't believe the place where God dwells is within our space-time. I believe right. it's outside of our universe. Right. And so there are some who disagree with That's that. There are, some, a distinction. there are some who would say that God dwells within the universe. God does dwell within the universe, but when, it, when we think of the throne of God Almighty, where Jesus is sitting at his right hand, I don't believe that's within our universe. I believe, you know, it talks about the earth being his footstool. I believe God is transcendent to time and space. And I'm not saying that there's multiple universes, by the way. There's no evidence for that. But I'm just saying that God exists in what's called the third heaven. Um, and so that's a good question. <laughs> well, no, I just thought it would be good at this point to make that distinction that Paul makes in the New Testament so we can understand right. how it relates to the... So when Elijah was caught up and Paul was caught up, they were caught up to a place outside of this universe into God's heaven. presence. Yeah. Not what ancient aliens teaches that, uh, you know, obviously that was a UFO that abducted <laughs> Elijah. So that's why we saw that on TV at one point. Um, that would not be biblical, so <laughs> to say the least. Um, I find this interesting. If you look at the bottom of page 44, if you haven't read this, um, I, 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 think, I think it's fascinating. In fact, let's read the verse in Job. On, actually, it's on page 45. Job 28:25. for those of you online who may not have the book. And if you're just turning Job 28, 25, 
Uh, it says God here, it says to make the weight of the winds. And, and, and it describes in Job 28, 25, the weight of the winds. And let me actually read the full verse. Let me go to that in my phone Bible here because I think, yeah, it says to establish a weight for the wind and apportion the waters by measure. When he's talking here, now, does this show gravity is existing? No, not, not in that sense. But what it does show, if you look through Job, how does Job describe the earth? He describes it as sitting on what? Does anybody remember the wording? How would you describe something floating in space if you didn't know what gravity was? Anybody know? You would, you would describe it as, um, maybe we need to get to, we will get to this verse in Job. It describes it as sitting on nothing. That's how Job describes it. And so, yeah, so you, you see this, and Isaiah, by the way, describes the earth as being round. And so the flat earth theory is out. We can, we can throw that out. We'll get to that at a different time. But Job describes the weight of the wind. We understand that uh, he describes the earth as being suspended on nothing. So we do understand that there's this mysterious force throughout the universe called gravity. And it really, if you ever wonder, why did things not just fly out of the earth? Why did the water not just fly out and disappear into space? Why are the stars staying where they're at? Um, why, why do the planets revolve around the sun? Why does any of this happen? It's because of gravity. And it's a really remarkable, a really remarkable force. Now, um, do we know that gravity, why gravity exists? We have no idea. Scientists have absolutely no clue why gravity exists. They, they will say this, and I've heard astrophysicists say this, we just know that it works, and that's good. <laughs> and so we know that it works, but we can't quite describe what it is, where it came from, and why we have it. How did it develop? And so if you look, that's just a small example of what we call the fine tuning of the universe. And so, you might have heard these arguments before for creation. For example, the Earth is the only planet we've seen in the entire universe. It, it's, it's literally designed for life. It, it, it could not have come about by accidental cause. We have one universe. And to say that this universe created itself from nothing and suddenly arranged everything in one little spot to fit highly intelligent life, it's the perfect distance away from the sun <laughs> Everything is micro-tuned so that we can live here. You have plants that obviously get rid of oxygen. We get rid of carbon dioxide. All of these things that could not have developed by natural chance. And so uh, oftentimes people will call this the fine-tuning uh, of the universe. And so I want to look back at Genesis 1 really quick and read a passage for you because I'm going to give you some homework to look at uh, ahead of time. Thank you. Not the pen out of the camera. <laughs> Um, I, want, I want to actually look at some things ahead of time, but if you look at Genesis uh, 1, uh, 9, I want to read 1, 9 uh, through 11 really quick. And I'll give you some thoughts for next week, and I'll give you some pages to read. Uh, it says, Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seeds. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit that yields, um, tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. Okay, so just stop for a second. I would like you to really break down verses 9 through 11 in chapter 1. And if you could read on, in fact, the rest of chapter 2. And, in fact, uh, up to page 53. I would suggest reading up to page 53. Uh, what I'm going to present to you uh, is, I'd say 50% of young earth creationists believe this. Uh, I'd say the other half take a different theory. Some people I really respect. But I'm going to make the case next week that there at one point in time was one continent on the earth, a super continent called Pangaea. I believe Genesis 1, 9 through 11 teaches this. And I believe the global flood can account for our current continents. Like, how did the continents break up? Be because of the flood. And I think we can also make the argument that the flood also caused what we know today as the Ice Age. 
And, and we'll talk later on why the Ice Age might have come about as a result of the flood. Yes. And those tectonic plates and the separation of all that stuff, you can, you can make a, a credible claim that a lot of that stuff was what helped, as you talked about Pangea or whatever. Yes. That, how I, I do believe from a strict reading of the text, Pangea is true. And I don't think that's something as Christians we need to be afraid of. I don't think it disproves the Bible. I don't think it's anti-biblical like some of the other things like evolution are. I think, in fact, it might answer a lot of questions that we have about mm -hmm. stuff. And so um, we'll get into that next week, uh, and I think we're pretty much out of time. So I'll close us in prayer. Everybody who joined us online, thank you. God bless you all, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in Thursday night's video. See you soon.